Hello, and welcome to the Six Figure Developer Podcast, the podcast where we talk about new and exciting technologies, professional development, clean code, career advancement, and more. I'm John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I'm John Ash. With us today is Fahim Memnon and Facundo Gauna. Fahim is a seasoned architect with hands-on experience in application engineering. Yes, in application engineering, cloud, containerization, automation, and mobile technologies. Facundo is a solutions architect specializing in Kubernetes on Azure. Welcome to both of you. Hey, thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Uh, so guys, uh, before we get started, uh, would you maybe give a little bit of a brief introduction to yourself to, to help our listeners sort of learn about who you are? Uh, maybe just like start with uh, sort of what, what got you started in the industry. Um, how about we start with Fahim? All right. Uh, thank you, Ash. So what got me started in the industry? Um, it really is a love at first sight kind of relationship with technology that I have. Um, like in the, after finishing my high school, I had some time, the vacation before my, um, like I, I was in high school in Pakistan, right? So high school there is basically after your 10th grade, which is, you know, different no levels. So I got like four or five months and I, there was an institute nearby. They had three eight six computers and DOS 6.22 running on those machines. And I was like, okay, I'm going to spend my you know vacation here. And uh, so learn DOS and I think basic, GW basic and Microsoft basic. It was this King Kong game and snake game. We just play those games and <laughs> really got started there. Uh, basic was my first kind of uh, real, um, you know, programming experience there and then got into C, but professionally when I started, when I was like, when I started my undergrad, I actually started doing Visual Basic. I learned, mm. I like found an old book of Visual Basic 5 and then quickly kind of read because I was from the basic, you know, background. So just quickly, you know, making these database applications for customers. I found a couple of customers in the market giving me like, like, you know, uh, sandwich money to make software for them, really. <laughs> um, so that's where I started. And slowly, you know, I just, you know, kept on doing more uh, and more programming. Once I finished my bachelor's, uh, got a start in a company um, in Pakistan, Islamabad. Worked there for almost uh, four years and then came over here. Kind of the same thing. Cool. Uh, how about you, uh, Fakunda? Cool. Yeah, I, I took on programming essentially during college. But my first job after college was essentially a, a junior developer as a .NET developer, right? So I did a whole lot of development on, you know, creating IS websites, WCF services, de desktop apps using, was it uh, WCF and the the other older technologies as well. So I spent a whole lot of time, you know, creating basic server side web applications for enterprises, mm -hmm. and then gradually moved into Angular and single page applications where I happened to stumble into the consultancy world and the DevOps world at the mm -hmm. same time. You make me sound old, Facunda. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, what, what, uh, how did that kind of bring you to where you guys are doing today? Uh, what, what do you do today? So today, for myself, I'm a solutions architect, and I work at a boutique consultancy firm where we help customers adopt Kubernetes. And myself, I specialize on helping customers adopt Kubernetes and Azure. Hmm. Same, pretty much so. Um, <clears throat> you know, we a um, couple years ago, um, you know, this box board, they reached out to me, and I was looking for a job because I was doing con government contracting for 10 straight years. And I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to do something different now. Maybe do some some real challenging work. And they reached out to me because of my .NET experience. They had a gap of somebody who knows Windows and Microsoft ecosystem. They had a bunch of, you know, um, Azure and uh, not, they had a bunch of like AWS and Linux, you know, folks on, on the team. So I saw that sounded like a great opportunity to learn something completely different that I have um, not done. It was the I never even worked on Docker container before joining <laughs> Boxwood. So just did a quick uh, ramp up and now they're kind of in the same boat as Facundo, you know, just helping customers um, adopt, you know, DevSecOps best practices, you know, mm -hmm. do CICD best practices, and then 
also adopt and, and accelerate their Kubernetes in, in, in a containerization mm -hmm. path. So if it's on-prem or is it in cloud, I focus on the Azure cloud um, in AKS, but we do all kinds of you know things in that in that space. Yeah, that's a that's a funny story actually. Um, I'm actually kind of recent to the company that I'm working with at Fahim, and the way I met Fahim was through an event. And then this event, he was asking a lot of really cool questions about Kubernetes. I was like, wow, this this guy sounds like he's doing a whole lot of Kubernetes, right? And at the time, I was essentially just an Azure consultant, helping clients with all sorts of services on Azure. Mm -hmm. And I saw this very strong need for Kubernetes and people just really struggling to adopt it because it was so hard compared to the other services on Azure. So essentially, I just wanted to focus on it and help more people with that strong pain point that I was seeing across the industry. So. I wanted to specialize and focus just on Kubernetes and Azure, and you know, I connected with Fahim, and then things went on from there. Yeah, it was uh, Facundo's you know initiative. He he reached out to me, just contacted me on LinkedIn, and then I think he was asking questions about um, he was doing uh, AK certification, uh, not not AK CK CKA certified Kubernetes administrator certification, and it was like. This guy is good in Azure because he has a blog, writes about it so much, and then he's like learning Kubernetes. This is a perfect fit for you know, what we do. So like you know, no brainer if he's interested. And I'm glad he was. And it's been great working with him. Yeah. What What does that path look like? As both both of you with a, a background in in .NET development, uh, what does that path look like from .NET to transitioning into cloud native using Kubernetes, using Docker? And, and what are those challenges that .NET developers or, or that you see .NET developers having in learning and adopting things like Kubernetes? I think personally, it's a very long path if depending whether you start from, like if you're starting from enterprise legacy applications hosted on IIS, I think it's a whole lot of learning ahead of you. And, um, you know, especially if you have to rethink about how you write applications from, you know, ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core, then how do you containerize it? And then how do you use the CI CD platform to publish your container images? Then all the way to how do you create your cluster and deploy the application on top of it? There's so much to learn, it's almost overwhelming. <laughs> and I think you have to take it slow for that, for that very same reason, right? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna back up with the Kundo here. Absolutely, I think um, you know going from a, a development a .NET code, a .NET developer, a lot of steps. But but as soon as you see that people that made switch from .NET framework to .NET Core, they already saw a difference that the IES was cut off, right? Before that, you were like Visual Studio is your world, and then you publish a button and then IES <laughs> takes over. You never get to see what happens behind the scenes. Yeah, this is your world. But once you go into .NET Core, you realize there is another server that you can run that can run your you know .NET code. So I think that kind of splits your mind into like there's more to it. And then once you get your head around those um, Kstrel and other you know HTTP servers and fun stuff, and then you start getting into okay, so this means I can run this as a process, no IAS. Um, I think that's kind of a good segue into it. So .NET Core really enables it, and people who are going from .NET framework to containers directly are I think they would have even harder time to translate everything from the container world into Microsoft container world. That's an even a harder path. So it is definitely, um, you know, you know, worth, worth looking into that transition into .NET and then breaking it down and then uh, uh, going from there, you know. Um, so it is a different world uh, of learning Docker yeah. and learning, you know, some of these concepts. Yeah, it's almost like a, a culture change as well that you have to make on your own. Like I remember I, I used to picture myself writing code and I would use lots of tools. Like the IDE would do everything for me. I would use ReSharper. I would you know write a whole lot of unit tests, and it would everything just kind of came to me, and it was really easy. SQL Server Management Studio was pretty easy as well. Click, click, click. Create a new table, right? Um, even you can even throw other tools on top of it, like the Redgate tools, and make it even more easy. But in the cloud native world, 
um, it's almost like you pick your own ingredient for everything because everything is open source. So you can pretty much swap in and out any piece of component that you want. And so the, there's a lot of gluing pieces together and there's the whole lot of like almost mind shift change I have to do to, to fully embrace the new world. Yeah. So, um, if someone is getting, trying to get into that, uh, what, what sort of steps, uh, are, what are the steps that you would sort of recommend them taking so that they can take off those bite size chunks that allow them to sort of move, uh, you know, and migrate those applications, uh, moving to dot, you know, um, dot net core, uh, introducing Docker, you know, changing maybe your workflow with like something like Cop uh, compose. And then when does even Kubernetes like come into the picture? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of avenues actually. Like for example, if you were to deploy to a cloud provider, you don't have to use Kubernetes to deploy your container. Like on Azure, you can use other other types of services like Azure Web Apps for Container or Azure Container Instances. So you could take it almost bite size at the infrastructure level. Um, on the other hand, you have to consider what you know and where you are in terms of skill sets to that, right? So if you know only C Sharp and TypeScript, then maybe you should pick up a, a scripting language as well to kind of uh, extend the way that you deploy your applications and and essentially do configuration, right? When you deploy your application on top of Kubernetes. I don't know, Fahim, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I think that's exactly right. So see how Fukudo quickly separated the, the app into pieces as in like, what's your configuration look like? Um, and, and, you know, how are you compiling or building your application? You get away from your Visual Studio more into these end to end life cycle of your application, right? So, so it's not just application now, even if it's, you know, whatever language or tool that you have, right? So expanding into scripting, like he said, right? So, so go to like CLI more, see if you can build your application without Visual Studio, right? So that's kind of the path that you go to the CLI and closer to that, use the tooling um, outside of that one GUI ecosystem. So you get closer to building script. So one of the things that I always, you know, had, because I kind of like started my career in such a way that I early on, I was building and you know working with these customers and like you know packaging my Visual Basic software. I figured out I can create an installer from Visual Basic. Apparently, there was this you know Visual Basic six installer, and I can give an installer to people. And I, I like that interface. So I kind of thought about this is the application. What is the end-to-end -end life cycle of this? How is this going to be deployed? What are the the things that you think about? You know, if you have like if you used Vix or any other install, install installers, like install shield, there's used to be big in Visual C++, right? If you're thinking like along the lines of where this piece of software is going to live eventually, what are the steps? Then it starts coming to your mind that, you know, packaging, what does application packaging look like? And that's packaging is where Docker comes in. It kind of makes it easier for you, really helps you. So start moving into more of the CLI tools, learn the scripting, separate, you know, understanding configuration as in like developing configuration and testing configuration. Whatever you're using, I think if you like get closer to these tools and it's going to be like the world is going to start making sense to you and you'll be like, oh, I need something like this. And you'll like epiphany Docker does that for me, right? Mm. That's the best way to kind of get into that. And it seems like we went from uh, we, we we have our, our monolithic application in Visual Studio. We right-click publish locally or, or we, we right-click publish to a, a server on our network. Uh, then we move to the cloud and, and maybe we right-click publish to Azure. Um, then we figured out we needed pipelines to to build and run tests and, and deploy to our cloud servers and, and our cloud application instances. Then we figured out that maybe we want to containerize our applications and that doesn't necessarily mean taking my MVC application and putting it in a container and then running that. It means designing for, for a cloud native application. Is that kind of what we're talking about here? And, and well, I think that's one path, actually. I think there's many different ways you could do it. I think the, the key, um, the key limitation, or I think the, the main thing you should think about is how many new technologies you adopt at once. Like mm -hmm. don't try to do 
everything at once and try to do Docker for the first time, CI, CD for the first time, Kubernetes or even the cloud for the first time all at once, that's going to be too much. Going back to your example, John, I mean, you could have a CI, CD pipeline deploy your uh, monolithic application on premises. Like, that's totally doable. And you can have scripts that configure the application you know, afterwards. And that's that could be your single point of entry to learning just CI, CD isolated from any other technology, right? So if I can play uh, devil's advocate for just a second, um, as a nine to five application developer, uh, generally, uh, hy the hypothetical me uh, would write my application, submit it to QA, and then I'm done. I, I don't care how it gets to to the internet. That's that's ops job or 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 the new DevOps job, right? Is is there any benefit for a developer? in that, that mode of operation to learning some of these tools? Or is there a benefit to having these tools in play for that developer? That's a good question. I think it depends on the journey of the company. Uh, based on my experience with customers, a lot of times you won't see the typical DevOps engineer. So it becomes a responsibility of some lead developer kind of taking that initiative on the back on their backs right and, and trying to uh, make it happen on their own and then eventually they might get some support because the business gets value out of it but um i mean it, it really it depends um i don't know for him what are your thoughts? yeah no i think that's the path okay the question right there you said like lead developer you can take it on do you want to be the same developer for five years or do you want to keep progressing and learning new things I, I don't think i've not seen any developer who's a good developer and always not learning something to become a senior developer to become a lead developer and once you become that that's basically not just doing you know implementing this in the code but also thinking what does the design look like what is going to be like the upgrade look like when i go into the what is like database migrations look like for this, right? So you should start answering those bigger questions, then you become senior. That means that your underlying technology, you're very comfortable with .NET Core and whatever you know entity framework has to offer. But now you are looking for how is this gonna be deployed eventually? You know, what is this DevOps uh, people are asking me? What is this, you know? Um, other like agile, how do I make this agile so that I can like, you know, turn on more versions, where is version management? So you start thinking about end to end once you are a lead developer. So I, I guess as you progress through your career, um, this does, this is going to come into your path and um, eventually you will have time and you'll have resources to look at it. And these, these conversations have changed pretty significantly over the the last few years. I mean, the the developers that are writing the code are no longer the uh, the people in the basement that you feed pizza and, and and soft drinks to, right? We're we're involved in the in the conversations on gathering requirements on uh, on on piecing together the applications on figuring out the deployment stories on security, on maintenance, on on maybe sunsetting. What does it look to to take an application out of production, right? So, so with that, I mean, we're we're looking into things like infrastructure as code and and making those deployable through pipelines. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. I think the worst thing that you could do is, as a developer, just kind of throw over a cluster or infrastructure over the wall to operations and just say, here, I want to use this new shiny thing, right? And it, it really becomes a collaboration between developers and operations to drive towards an end goal. And uh, for example, I, I worked with a customer once that they had this really monolithic system running on IaaS on-prem and it was just not scaling, right? So they wanted to go to Kubernetes to leverage some of the scalability features and some of the reliability features. And given their use case, they had to work together between developers trying to refactor the applications to work with the monolith, but also as a microservices .NET Core based architecture. And from the operations perspective, they have to deploy the new Kubernetes infrastructure to host these applications. It was a very, very collaborative effort that it was just not feasible without that type of, type of collaboration. 
Yeah. yeah so um, when you were talking about sort of those first steps, the, the th what you met, what you mentioned was sort of sort of moving out of that Visual Studio workflow and saying separate and saying, hey, okay, let's maybe add a scripting technology. Uh, is the reason why you did that because um, in thinking about containerization, uh, Windows containers by themselves are not really there yet. They're, 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 they're definitely not as competitive as the Linux containers. And when you're developing, most .NET developers are you know working in that Visual Studio, you're on Windows. Uh, and so even building the application, the application runtime is actually built using a different OS and it has to be built, uh, um, you know, to be running on a different OS uh, if it's gonna run inside of Docker. So, um, and then that Docker definition is, that Docker file is sort of like a, uh, it's like a script, right? That actually builds those steps, those steps out. So getting that scripting language helps you understand how, how do I build my step? How do I build my application? Um, in a sort of script manner. And then uh, that sort of opens you up to putting this into Docker and saying, allowing it to run in a no another OS being built inside of another OS and for another operating system that you're not used to. So how, how do you, from a, dev from a .NET Windows developer, sort of switch over to that sort of Linux um, and deal with the, that, that Linux bash mindset? So I can talk about my experience, but essentially, even you know, many years before I knew I, I wanted to switch into the cloud native world, I saw it as a upcoming trend. I took the decision to learn scripting really well, and I, I learned PowerShell, and I used it on Windows almost on my day to day. There's even a pluralsight course I think called PowerShell for Developers, mm -hmm. and that kind of forced me to essentially think about everything in terms of commands and how it can modify things in terms of commands, because what you won't get in containers is the user interface or the GUI, right? Mm -hmm. You won't be able to modify the registry by just going to the system preferences. You're going to have to do everything scripted in a way that, you know, it's compatible with immutable infrastructure. Yeah. Now I'm going to piggyback on it. I mean, for example, .NET CLI. Use .NET. I mean, it's gotten really robust now. So rather than Everything in there, you can use .NET CLI, you can use um, uh, like in PowerShell, uh, you know, there's very nice scripting in PowerShell. And then uh, SQL Server now has a SQL Server CLI, which is, I think, pretty cool. I guess is IES ADM command, I think. So so whatever you're doing, I think you can find a CLI command for it. Uh, PowerShell, making a registry change in PowerShell is so easy. It's like a path. You could go in and say, this is my path, and the database is different. So so definitely, I think if you start with just the CLIs and then do like simple PowerShell scripting, that is a, a, a very nice um, gateway. And then on, on containers, uh, one of the things that I like is imitate. You don't have to be expert to do something. You know, start imitating because, you, you know, if your core job is to run Docker containers, then you need to know it. <laughs> but if it's like something you're learning, then mm -hmm. imitate. See like what's out there. There's a there's a tons of good documentation available from Microsoft, from Docker, from a bunch of people. Go and try to run those things. Just like try and experiment with it and see how it's doing it. Try to like break it down and decode it versus going from like, I'm going to go, you know, learn the ABCs first and do this. Like just follow a tutorial and break it down and try to understand it, right? Docker Desktop, if you're on Windows or Mac, you know Docker Desktop is is a very good product and makes it so easy. Comes with a GUI interface, but don't use GUI. Use the CLI again. Um, you know, if you want to like create a Docker file, um, right click in your Visual Studio, and I think there's like a command now which can just spit out a Docker file for you. A lot of instances now people are moving away from Docker file too, not. Like it's still like very dominant in the industry. Don't tell my colleagues, but but people are like moving away to these uh, like build packs or something yeah. else, which would automatically create a Docker image for you without a Docker file based on like Maven or based on your um, CS proj instructions, right? So yeah. 
So it doesn't mean, I mean, it's uh, don't worry about, do oh, I have to learn 50 things. Just follow a tutorial and then make something, feel good about it. And then just, you know, start breaking it down. Like what is really happening behind the scenes, right? Yeah, that is for me, it's like the best thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, to that point, I mean, I've created uh, applications containerized in my right click at Docker file or right click deploy to Kubernetes, right? And the stuff that it's generated sometimes is confusing and that will kind of force you to look at it, inspect it, play with it and figure out what it's trying to really do. I think the, the danger of just going with the default vanilla things is that if you ever want to leave the box, right? It, you won't be able to modify it or extend it or it, you know, if you have a production issue and there's some type of permissions issue that you don't understand because it's it, the Linux, you know, file system, then you're going to run into trouble. So that's where the fundamentals come in. Huh. So uh, something interesting that I, I thought I would I would look up uh, hypothetically uh, while you guys were talking about PowerShell, because uh, Ash had mentioned that, you know, Linux was the predominant Docker uh, environment um, and you know we all know that you can get bash on Windows either through the um, the subsystem or like get bash right but um, something I didn't know is PowerShell is actually open sourced and available on Linux so that it is yeah yeah you could have you could have PowerShell in your docker container doing stuff for you if you already know that scripting language so mm -hmm. that's pretty cool yeah exactly a few years ago I actually automated some of my key pieces of my job away by essentially running a PowerShell core task on Azure Container Instances and just like triggering these automated jobs using PowerShell. I would never do that at a customer today, but that was just a kind of an example of how I could push myself to use scripting as opposed to using a C Sharp container or TypeScript or whatever else, right? To, to push myself to the limit. That was all I had. PowerShell's on Linux. <laughs> hey, PowerShell on Mac too. So PowerShell PWSH, that's like a global, it's the only universal uh, interpreter available at this time, you know? I mean, really it runs on uh, anywhere you go. And once you, if you learn PowerShell, those are skills are right now. I would think that's like way good skill to have PowerShell scripting, absolutely. Yeah, or, or Bash as well, right? I actually, um, I run a VM on my Windows laptop. And the reason for that, it's a Linux VM, right? Mm -hmm. But the reason for that is to really immerse myself in that world. Um, because uh, I don't want to be like half C's in, half C's out. <laughs> um, so for example, like when I learned English many years ago, when I immigrated to this country, I had taken English classes before coming to this country. But when I got here, I did not know what people were saying to me. And the only way I could actually learn is by immersing myself in the culture. So um, I'm kind of doing the same thing with Cloud Native is really immersing myself in the Linux culture. And you know, I'm going to put away the, the, the Windows terminal for, for some time. And, and you both have said that you work primarily with your clients to help them get up to speed and, and... Uh, can containerize their applications and, and help them migrate or, or be successful in the cloud, you, mostly using Azure. But but what about Azure and and or AWS? I mean, containerizing containerizing applications and, and putting them in Docker and, and running in Kubernetes means that that if if we containerize this, we can effectively run this anywhere. Do you do you take into consideration the the cloud provider when you're putting together your infrastructure as code? Are you using ARM templates? Are you using Terraform? Are you using something else? A um, lot of Terraform lately. I think um, I do worry about the cloud provider because it seems like each cloud provider has their own philosophy and they have their own flavor of doing things. Like Azure is very much like, you know, the Visual Studio paradigm of making it really easy for you to get going and you don't have to worry about the low-level details, where I'd, AWS is kind of the, the inverse. But how about like AKS versus EKS? How do you see that? Do you think that, that applies to that too, even the Kubernetes? 
Um, even at just the, the high level of just interfacing with AWS, it's kind of very much infrastructure level, right? Like you have to pick the default region as opposed to Azure where it just kind of handles, you know, which region you want to deploy your things into. So there are some differences. I don't think you can truly be cloud agnostic. I think you can be cloud portable and think about how you can move your application between cloud providers at some point, but there's there will be some rework at some point. Yeah. I, I agree. I think there's always some um, some magic glue that you know you need to you need to know. And in Terraform, I mean, I love Terraform. Like Fukuda said, you know, well, I mean, if I would apply like vSphere, uh, you change anything anything on vSphere, you're deploying your VMs, um, Nutanix, you know, on-prem stuff, and then in the cloud too. So whatever you're doing, Terraform is amazing. That's one of the tools that I think used the most after I would say this containers and Kubernetes. Terraform is like, you know, always comes first and then later comes the kubectl manifests and, and Docker files. And and that brings up the most important question of, of the episode. Is it kubectl or is it kubectl? Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be, there's gonna be a fight here. <laughs> yeah, there's another one, is it kubectl? So there's also like cuddle isn't like cuddling with somebody. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's true. I mean, it's a, uh, I have this graphics where you have like kubectl, the, the brain kind of starts lining up and the cuddle, like you got the lights shining from your brain out. So, <laughs> um, I mean, whatever is, uh, whatever you feel like the day, that day, you know, if you are having trouble with it, call a kubectl, distance yourself from it. <laughs> if you like it, say, good, good. It's kube cuddle that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I personally me. call it kubectl though. Yeah, I always uh, call it kubectl. Un unfortunately, I'm prone to type Q QCT, kubectlt, and of course, it can't find anything, so I have to alias that, as, which is probably not a good idea. But <laughs> why, why fix the typo? <laughs> um, what uh, What about folks who might want to be getting started in um, sort of transitioning their apps? Um, any anything that we talked about, like uh, you know, uh, .NET Core, getting started with uh, PowerShell scripting, um, getting started with Docker, getting started with Kubernetes, um, or Terraform for that matter. What do you have any resources or anything that you might be able to point people in in uh, directions that would be like a good jumping off point for them? Microsoft has a lot of really good like almost workshops. I think, I um, don't remember quite the link we can put on the show notes, but they, they have a AKS workshop where they walk you through essentially deploying infrastructure on AKS and just walking you through deploying a Redis database, I believe. Um, that's all I can think of. Yeah, I think Docker Alpha is good um, documentation. If you go to docs.docker.com, they have a, um, like if you're containerizing .NET apps, so they have like manifests and then go into the description of the manifest. So, so you can learn from that too. That's like a very good starting point. Microsoft is, I feel like they have exactly the same manifests and their docs at Microsoft.com as well. So if you're containerizing, um, go look up like what is Microsoft say to get started. Um, and then just go from like one step at a time, like Fukuda said, you know, um, learning the .NET CLI, going on to like, okay, new get packages, and then slowly, it does have very good documentation. Um, they, they have the learning path thing that Microsoft has, that Fakuna was talking about. They have tons of learning paths too. I think that's also a good way to get started. Third, I think generally, if you want to learn about containers, um, one of the content that I love is Mamshad Manamad. He has a YouTube channel too. So I think it's like a couple of hours of like Docker introduction and just fundamentals. And if you like feel like really immersing one day kind of in it, <laughs> Mamshad has a ton of good content. Um, I just, you know, love what he puts out. Right. Um, I just thought of a couple more resources, but um, there's Katakoda, which is essentially you can take bite sites examples and do tutorials on how to use Kubernetes and Docker. Um, and that is also, if you want to take it very seriously, you could try to achieve the certified Kubernetes uh, developer, application developer mm -hmm. certification, this CCAD. And that one's very focused on creating deployments and how do you 
you yeah. essentially, you know, package your application to work on, on Kubernetes raw manifest and you know, how do you do configuration management, secrets management, all that stuff. So that could be a, a nice little push for yourself to get actually a nice little certification and get some hands-on experience and force yourself to, to learn the material. All right. Uh, so for both of you, uh, what has been helpful in your careers that uh, you might share with those just getting started or maybe those looking to level up their own careers? Um, I would say take your time, learn a few things at a time, use them well. Um, you resist the urge on the shiny object syndrome and think about who you're deploying this software for and who's going to maintain it so that it's not just you know an application that you're going to be deployed for you and your team that there's other people involved in the project as well like operations security and all those aspects so think about the the project holistically yeah i think he stole a couple of points from what i'm going to say without knowing it so think about holistically definitely think about end to end like okay making this who's going to use it what are they, you know, how is this going to be deployed? Uh, things like that. I think it does, if you have that perspective on software and, and think about like it's going to come back and I'm going to do V2 off it. If you have that perspective, I think that helps. And then other thing that is very important is to never like, um, like, you know, be really, you know, don't marry a technology, you know? Technologies change very rapidly. So if you are into those arguments, like this is better than this, <laughs> that you're, you're investing a lot of energy in that conversation, you know, look at the value of what it's providing um, and, and then move on from one technology. You, you have a technology, you have a solution, you make something, you find something better, move on. So always be ready to find something better, something cooler. I think that keeps me going personally that, um, that I, I'm always open to learn new technologies. Um, and, and listen to new ideas. Like I'm not married to anything. And I feel like a lot of people have a lot of good ideas and I really want to benefit from the, you know, knowledge that everybody has rather than just saying, you know, I, but what I thought of is the best thing in the world. I think it's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. So so keep open, don't marry technology, uh, technology is changed. And then uh, one thing at a time, like Facundo said, um, and be holistic. Very cool. Um, where might our listeners go to follow you and just like keep up with you, what, what, what you're working on? For myself, I try to blog quite a bit on uh, gaunacode.com. So that'd be G-A-U-N-A -A, and then code.com. And I just blog about Kubernetes and Azure and just kind of the experiences and the problems I'm tackling at the time. I am actually bad at helping community and this is why I'm like, I want to jump and doing um, uh, something nice. And that's why I jumped on this podcast. And thank you guys for having me. Uh, but basically, at Twitter, at Fahim is the best way to follow me and then um, get in touch with me if you have any questions. And then I, I started posting stuff on LinkedIn too. But I keep, I plan on having Twitter as my main Twitter and GitHub, you know, Fahim556. Um, I couldn't find Fahim um, in, in LinkedIn, uh, in GitHub, it was, it was taken. Um, but at Fahim and Twitter was available. A lot of Fahims out there, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, Twitter is the best way uh, to, to be in touch and ask any questions and follow up. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Um, if you just hang out just a few minutes chat, we're going to wrap up the recording for the podcast and we'll continue the conversation in chat. Uh, so just hang tight and we'll be back to address any questions there. So Fahim, Facundo, thanks for, uh, th thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. That was Fahim Maman and Facundo Ghana. Fahim is a seasoned architect with hands-on experience in application engineering, cloud, containerization, automation, and mobile technologies. Facundo is a solutions architect specializing in Kubernetes on Azure. If you like this episode, please like, rate, and review on iTunes. Find show notes, blog posts, and more at sixfiguredev.com. 
and catch us live each week on Twitch and be sure to follow us on Twitter at Six Figure Dev. This has been another episode of the Six Figure Developer Podcast, helping others reach their potential. I'm John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I'm John Ash. Why, Ash? Why? And occasionally read John's lines. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. We So both Ash and I have signed off as Clayton before. So, uh, <laughs> so sometimes we get our own names wrong, but yeah, whatever. Um, Teleprompter. Yeah. Yeah, I, so I've, I've dabbled in Kubernetes for a while to some mild success. I, I know just enough to, to be dangerous. And, um, you know, I started reading about Kubernetes a, a year or two ago, two, two or three maybe, um, and, and really not utilizing it very much, so really not maintaining very much. Um, and then from time to time have, have jumped in and helped out on a couple of different projects running in Kubernetes, um, playing with Helm and Tiller, and then Tiller isn't a thing anymore. It, is Kubernetes, it seems like Kubernetes is maturing. Is there still significant um, strides that need to, to be taken? Is, is it still, because it, it seems like there's still a lot of moving parts that you at least need to be aware of. Is that just, is that just part of, part of the game these days or is there still improvements that can and are and are being made i think it's part of the game i mean kind of the the, the problem that john was describing um it's, it's pretty intimate right like you have to know and understand how to debug kubernetes and all the various components um it itself it's like a microservices based architecture so there's so many moving parts underneath it that you have to understand what's going on Otherwise, it's really hard to reason and troubleshoot things. Um, on the other hand, too, um, because the platform is maturing, also the ecosystem around it is maturing. So there's every day like new tools being created that you can deploy on Kubernetes, like CI CD tools like Argo CD and then Flux. And it's, it's just a, a huge array of tools on top of Kubernetes that you can deploy to that. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at it, it's a... It's one of the biggest projects, open source projects in the world. So if you have, you know, that many, uh, that much, you know, participation coming in from community, you can imagine, you know, so many people trying to do something, they would be creating that many tools, right? So that's kind of what goes proportionally with it. And yeah, it is, so it is maturing. And, um, you know, right now it does have a lot of pieces and components and people are looking at different ways and how to simplify that and how to package it so that it's easier. In AKS as an example, right? It's you go in and you run this one command and then you have like a bunch of things configured for you with the best practices out there, right? So mm -hmm. there are things uh, um, that you can do. And uh, But I, I would feel like if somebody is doing this on a side, it's gonna be hard to keep up versus if you're doing this like as a main part of your job, right? Because of how rapidly things change every every quarter there's a new release uh kubernetes you know minor version comes up and introduces you know new things in it uh even for you know I, I will be honest even for me sometimes it's hard to catch up with these things even though i'm doing this for as a job so it does it does it is moving fast there are a lot of pieces a lot of solutions out there but um but you know as long as you have like the fundamental idea and the concept of how things are you know going you would be in a good spot but you know like where this fits in your mind in terms of your technology map, this is where Kubernetes fits. And then that's where I think you will find a lot of answers. What about instrumentation and, and you know, keeping up to date on the health of your system, the, the overall health of your system? Is, is it just attach application insights and, and you're done? Is there um, additional tools that you, that you recommend, that you play with, that you can't live without? Yeah, I think it depends of where you work, honestly. Like, I think if you're in an enterprise, they're probably going to want to centralize the monitoring and offload it to a centralized monitoring team. And at that point, you're talking about you know using Splunk or mm. uh, maybe even uh, an APM like what's the one that Cisco creates? Um, I, I, their name is eluding me, but they're everywhere. Uh, oh, AppDynamics. You know mm -hmm. they. They, they pay a lot of money for app dynamics, so they want to figure out how to reuse that, right? 
don't know if Fahim, what, what have you run into before? Oh, we have Dynatrix, App Dynamics, um, Multiplication Insights, Prometheus. So, so there are a bunch of tools out there out there that I've worked with. But you know, App Insights is like a, is your first gateway into that. That's the drug you get, right? So once you have App Insights and you see all kinds of cool metrics coming in, failure rates and the things you can do with it, um, then you get into this, okay, now you want custom metrics, get fancy, right? Um, something that you are not measuring. So I think the first thing is just like drop in something, make it easy for you. Um, and you start seeing these numbers and and then the next level comes in and then you're like, now I want something even better. I want a metric of how many people are going to my cart, not just like request rate, but like, okay, what is the drop rate or something? I don't know. Um, so, so you can get a, get fancy with the um, with the metrics and things, but you always have one. I would say, some people get it. Some people have it so that they have two. <laughs> so one would be like for apps, and one would be for infrastructure, but it would also have an overlap, right? Okay. So, mm -hmm. so I, I, you know, the more more information you have, the be better it's going to be. There's also like these tracing tools now, like Jaeger and. It, Okay, let's not talk about, I think it's like a lot of tools, but you know, yes. but there's a lot of things, but have something, have something, get some good numbers in it, see your iterate, your, your how your request is doing. Um, and the, it started with like least instrumentation as possible, right? The more, more work that you have to do is gonna stop you from adopting the tool. Do like the drop-in thing, you just include like SDK in your uh, code and then you are up and running and then start, you know, from that. Got it. So start with least possible, which is none, and then just leave it and never touch it again. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not a fan of flying blind. So uh, at the at the very least, I want to you know wire up application insights and, and at least have some insight uh, uh, your into our yeah into our application uh, app insights. It's really nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're good. and we've been playing with uh, app, with Kubernetes a little bit on the stream. We do some live coding on Wednesday evenings. Uh, the the three of us have our own personal projects that we kind of rotate through. Uh, Clayton's got a Blazor game engine that is a, a port inspired of uh, inspired by Mono Game. Uh, Ash is is doing a a weightlifting training workout thing in React and .NET Core, .NET five maybe. We'll get you there, um, yeah. and then uh, then we've got a, a speaker meet application for in uh, .NET five and React, um, and then we we had a guest on that Kubernetes Kubernetesified the the application pieces for us, and then we're gonna have some a, an additional guest on in a week or two maybe that he's gonna show us a little bit on K nines and and all of the funness that that might introduce for us. Yeah, that sounds cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I have I have a side project of my own, but eventually gonna grow into hopefully a very complicated Kubernetes setup. But I have like a, a Raspberry Pi running here next to me, and it's like a four node cluster. And mm -hmm. eventually gonna have like some type of integration with an AKS cluster on the cloud. You know, having some type of hybrid architecture, and hopefully have and have distributed across all the clusters. So we'll get there one day, but I'm, I'm, you know, chipping away at it day by day. Yeah. Uh, so one thing I know Clayton, you have struggled with, uh, and honestly, we don't, uh, for my team. So we use AK, we use uh, Kubernetes, but, um, for like the actual app development, um, the, running the applications and developing in Kubernetes is kind of tedious and uh, difficult. So uh, is that is that something that is a part of your workflow or that you guys have seen people using successfully? Is there a pattern there? Or is pretty much everyone just using Docker Compose um, on the develop, development side and it is until um, really you're starting looking at deploying that you really bring Kube into the equation? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I see a lot of Docker Compose on on developers really, um, because that just you don't have to learn something new. 
um, and you, you already have like a stack file, you just run it locally. That mm -hmm. works perfectly. Um, if you want to just separate, just go like one step further and just run this command, Docker swarm in it. Then you have secrets on the same node. So you have like one node swarm, um, which is like an alternative to, doc to Kubernetes but using the same Docker file and Docker Compose kind of mechanism. <laughs> so you got a little more out of your Docker um, desktop, right? Yeah. So that's a, I, I, I just use it a lot and I recommend using Docker Compose as much as possible before getting into Kubernetes. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. well, one, of the, one of the things that we've run into um, is, so we have like most, most of our apps, uh, they, you know, using Compose work, works just fine. However, because we're running sort of like behind uh, an ingress um, object, the actual like for our authentication services, and we're developing um, the the tools that are using our authentication services. Um, that that tool can be difficult and can be more problematic uh, because the development environment isn't running behind that ingress, especially if you're using something like Docker Compose, but then um, wiring it up to uh, sort of debug, well, what's this actually going to do in production or what's this actually going to do in just even in our dev or integration environment? Um, that can be a, a big challenge. So uh, that's where we've started trying to introduce some Kubernetes um, into the workflow. But it, again, it's been pretty difficult and... and um, definitely cumbersome right now. So uh, it seems like something that, that um, I, we haven't really found a great solution for, but I was just wondering if someone else, if you guys had run across good solutions there. Yeah, it depends. I mean, I, th I think there's so many solutions for that. One thing you could try is like beta environments, essentially like you, uh, which is a company, I think it's Basecamp that has this notion of beta environments and beta clusters, and you deploy from your feature branches to essentially a product, very production-like environment where it's using actual production data, and you are essentially, in, in a way, testing production, but that's super advanced, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you I want to... I guess like you could attach like a debugger to those to those pods or whatever. If you were kind of, I mean, it, it kind of forces you to write telemetry, you really, really good mm -hmm. telemetry. Is using your production telemetry to diagnose applications. Okay. Okay. So you have to be almost continuous deployment type of style in your DevOps maturity to to get to that level because it's really advanced. But um, the other the other aspect, I mean, there's there's more tools you could throw the problem right. There's Kind, which is like a single node Kubernetes cluster that you can run locally. And then if you use like a GitOps workflow, then every time you commit, like you can essentially deploy automatically to your one node cluster. Or even to a shared cluster, right? Um, but that 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 it unfolds a huge can of worms of what's your branching strategy like, and yeah, what's yeah, your testing strategy like, and stuff like that. Yeah, so we're, we're we have something that's very similar, and so it isn't terrible for us. Um, we basically have continuous uh, development to environments that are very similar to production, um, sort of like the, those beta environments that you're talking about. And we're using DevOps pipeline. So as soon as you commit to that master branch, but we don't, we don't deploy until we hit that master branch. Um, and the, but what we do do is have the build build system build and create the Docker images. And so it builds out all of the containers and it also builds up the, um, sort of kube um, deployment scripts, the config, kube configs that, that would be necessary. And so right now what we have it is uh, you can download those and we're using the Kubernetes that's sort of built into Docker desktop uh, and you can do like a, apply those local configs that get de get built. But you still have to commit commit your commit your changes to your local repo, push them up, um, wait for the build system to to build everything, then pull that down, and then and then apply it. And then even once you're applying it, then there's additional um, <laughs> like issues with uh, a, a. We're using the Azure Container Registry, where the Azure Container Registry, in order to get a token, you can only get like a three hour token. So then you have to like refresh your app, your Kube Secrets in order every three hours in order to like. Um, mm -hmm like pulled containers uh and the pull the new ones and so i don't know it's just there's been a lot of just like tons of issues and that's assuming you had 
and that like that's just for our app but then that's assuming you've like have the other things set up like the ingress and all, all of the other jazz so yeah it, it's just been very um i've i've been looking for a way to better um give the developers a chance and a way to test exactly what's going to happen before we push that code to master because uh, they're doing code reviews they're, they're they're even like pulling that code up and and running it as part of their review process but it would be fantastic if i could just have them say here with one one or two commands pull that code in and the entire instance of the application is all running locally for them um, before it even gets deployed out to any one of our integration environments or anything like that yeah, have we tried uh, uh, the aks uh, has this bridge now. They used to have, I think, dev spaces, but bridge, which solves so the same problem, actually, that you have a container locally. Well, you have an app locally, and you want to test it with the running cluster in dev or whatever environment, you know. So basically, it deploys that container from your machine, giving you the debugger, mm -hmm. and then gives you the URL, which is connected with the cluster, with the ingress. So you can mm -hmm. go to that and even, like, send, like, anybody else that URL and say, Hey, hit this URL. So you work like all of the you get connected with the cluster. There's a similar open source project, telepresence. Okay. So that's the same thing. Okay. Basically, run your local container, even though it's running on your machine and you can have a debugger in it. Right. Um, but but then it modifies like creates a tunnel on your machine with a cluster and then modifies the IP, you know tables to, to to whenever that you come from a particular route it ends up in your container and then you go okay. back up even if the microservice you don't have to install like 30 services you can just install right. your service yep. have a debugger vs code hit it and then i think telepresence does it uh dev space dev space is now bridge connect dev space is bridge okay yeah, yeah no, i'll have to take a look at that uh yeah because we've been just i mean um for the most part, uh, Docker Compose works pretty well, but every now and then we have these like really weird scenarios that running in Kubernetes behind the ingress is just a different yeah. experience. What Fakuru was talking about was the GitHub flow, um, mm -hmm. which is that when you commit something, like it's afterwards you have like tested things, then you commit it, and then, then it becomes a PR, and then creating an environment, like a test environment based on the PR, you could have a dev cluster and some kind of an automation there to do that for you, but it is an advanced, like you said, yeah. an advanced workflow. Yeah, you can take it as far as having like a preview environment, right? Like as soon as you open the yeah. PR, yeah. you have a link to access the instance you have. It's advanced, but I mean, I, it's also worth like stepping back a, a thousand levels and, and see how you look from the outside in. I, I once worked with this customer where they had huge deployment pains. So they were taking like four hours to deploy their app to production twice a week. And outside looking in, I'm like, do they have a monolith, you know, legacy oh, right, app? Right. Yeah. And then um, I start asking questions and they're using AKS, they're using full CI CD. They actually, they, they weren't using full CI CD. They had CI and then they were using something very trendy, which is GitOps. So they were using Argo CD, deploying their, their microservices to AKS. Um, but for some reason, their deployments were really painful, right? Yeah, and that's yeah. kind of the, the the aim of Kubernetes, and you know that it's it aims to to solve deployment pains and the ability to give you zero downtime deployments and the ability to test in production. But they didn't have any of those capabilities. And I think it's because they took it too far with embracing mm. it too much at once, and essentially. They had a very complex architecture with many microservices that mm. a single developer had essentially had to worry about and develop on their machine, right? So it's just really complicated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pre-optimization is the will, will kill you. <laughs> yeah, no, I've seen that a lot where companies or developers who just kind of take it too far with microservices and they. Yeah, they it's a distributed monolith, right? And they they can't deliver software because right. no matter what technology they have underneath, uh, they can't go fast enough because of self-imposed problems. Yep. Yeah, with that, do you even even with a even with a microservices architecture and 
truly distributed, not hopefully monolith. There's still some interaction sometimes that that you're you unlikely to avoid, right? Or or at least you need to to be able to determine that a service is up and responding and doing a thing. Do you do you have any recommendations or suggestions on post deployment testing on making sure that um, that new service I just deployed works and interacts with the other services it's supposed to and isn't brought down by any rogue service or, or like what is what are the the more advanced things to use to to ensure I mean we, we talked about logging and metrics and analytics and and that type of thing but but is there anything that does active polling or testing smoke tests or, or post deployment tests or, or something that you would recommend um, off the top of my head, there's a few ways you can solve that problem. But for example, Istio, the service mesh, essentially you can mirror traffic. So let's say you have a new recommendations engine and it's query only. You can mirror a new version of your microservice um, using Istio. So all the production traffic goes to this copy of the backend service that you're testing with real life data, right? And uh, you can do that behind the scenes without the user actually knowing. On the other on the other hand, this takes a little bit more work in development and orchestration, but you can use feature flags. And essentially, um, as long as you add in front of your monolith, right, like a feature flag to say, I want to test this new service, then you could potentially expose your service and the new functionality you have on this new architecture uh, behind a feature flag and only maybe you've rolled out to internal users. And that's actually a really good way to maybe get started with Kubernetes in production is like as you're strangling away the microservices, just add a feature flag in front and start testing gradually and get some experience without doing a big band deployment. Yeah, I think those are perfect examples. I, I agree with Kuno and then APM, like, you know, then you said, you have application performance monitoring, you can see, you know, what's going on and something turns red, you kind of go and fix it, right? One of the things that uh, my team, for as far as like post uh, deployment tests, um, doesn't really necessarily fit your, your continuous testing, but you could you could definitely do that. Um, but we we've been using Newman, um, which is like a JavaScript package for for uh, basically just having some simple uh, queries that we can run against uh, an environment that's spun up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, then answer the question too. I, so I, I did something similar as, as well too, where as part of the pipeline, we would run like smooth tests and like spin up the containers using Docker Compose and, and just do a suite of integration. Well, not, it wouldn't want to be integration, but it'd be like full end to end tests um, using Pester, which is like a PowerShell framework. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was like a nice little easy way to run essentially smoke tests as part of the pipeline. Um, also, you can do like auto band tests nightly. So it could use case so that could be like load tests and you can trigger a nightly load test to run against your system, uh, especially before you actually release it. And then, you know, by the time you get into the office or I guess you get into your home office in the morning, you'll, you'll see a full list of all the things that were run against your system and what kind of the performance was on each of the endpoints and whatnot. And load testing can be really simple. It doesn't have to be complex, but it can be really complex. Yep. Yeah, and, and we could probably do this all night, guys, uh, but I want to be respectful of your time. I um, wanted to be sure to say thank you. I really do appreciate you coming on and, and answering all our questions and, and telling some great stories and, and giving some, some great tips and tricks. Um, we are looking at about three weeks out from releasing the episode. So unless you've got something that you'd like us to coordinate with, uh, we are looking at the 22nd of February. Uh, so we'll get the audio all cleaned up and, and edited, and then we'll be blasting the internet with uh, links to the, to the podcast episode. Um, you know, if, if there's anything that you need from us, uh, anything that we can do to help out, then just let us know. Otherwise, we will uh, we will be back 
on uh, Wednesday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern for live coding and next week at 6 p.m. Eastern on Monday with another live episode of the podcast. Uh, with that, guys, uh, any parting words or words of wisdom for us? <laughs> no, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having us. And thank you for Kundo for inviting me to join you. This has been fun. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. All right. Great stuff. All right, Chet. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out. We will raid our friend over at Mastermind. Uh, look for us on Wednesday and next Monday. So with that, good night, everyone. Good night.